Uh, yes. <laughs> yes, we were had the echo meeting we just finished. Thank you. And my video as well. So we've got people starting to join. I think what we'll do is we'll start. Um, so I'll just do some introductions before we actually get into the talk and that will en enable a few more people to join us. Um, so thank you everybody for joining this afternoon. I'm delighted to be joined by um, Alexandros Papakristidis from King's College Hospital and Ronit Rajani from Gleisen St Thomas's Hospital, who are going to um, spend the next hour talking a little bit about um, valve disease. Um, we'll be recording the session, so hopefully by being here you're agreeing to the consent that the um, session is recorded. But please put your speakers on to mute. Um, and after the session we will be circulating the recording, um, the link to the recording, which you can then refer to and um, forward to your colleagues if, if you think that would be helpful. Um, we'll also be sending out at that point the CPD certificates and we'd also like some um, feedback, so we'll be sending out a very short survey for feedback. The session will be in four parts, um, each lasting about 10 minutes, and um, the speakers will be asking for questions at that point. So hopefully it'll be a very interactive session. Um, and so, we'll, so I will, without further ado, pass over to Alexandros, who's going to start off by talking about identifying valve disease. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Salian, and, uh, and thank you, Ronak, for organizing joining this uh, this interesting meeting. Um, now I will start with my topic which is how to identify the valve disease the primary care and I'm just starting sharing my slides now. So this is the uh, I don't know if you can see that. Yes we can see that. I guess I'm going to bring that up. So to identify valve disease in the primary care, you follow the steps that you do to identify any pathology in, in medicine. It's nothing different. So you look at the history, including the previous medical history, the social history, the family history and physical examination. There are other things that you can do, uh, including an ECG and of course the echocardiogram. Uh, which uh, Ronak is going to talk to you about this, and the echo is the, the final test you're going to request when you uh, suspect uh, and valve disease is the primary care. So the history starts always with the symptoms, and the symptoms which are suggested for valve disease are exertional breathlessness, reduction in exercise tolerance with no other obvious cause, and exertional chest pain, which usually manifest in aortic stenosis and uh, it's less common in other valve pathologies. Presyncope or syncope, and again, this is more common in aortic stenosis and uh, in particular severe aortic stenosis. And palpitations, which can manifest pretty much in all valve pathologies, are more common in mitral valve pathologies, which are accompanied by um, left edge of dilatation. Uh, moving forward, it is uh, necessary to look at the previous medical history of uh, each one of your patients. Uh, someone with previous chest radiotherapy is likely to have heart valve disease, and this is something that we can see now more commonly in, in our practice. This is because people with uh, cancer now survive longer, and there's a long interval between the radiotherapy sessions and the presentation, so there is time for the valve disease to develop. And we see them usually affects the mitral or the aortic valve. We see some thickening on the valve, which can cause uh, stenosis or regurgitation. So previous chest radiotherapy is something that you can point towards valve disease as also coronary artery disease. Uh, carcinoid disease is some definitely related to right heart valve disease, uh, but it's uncommon this patient to come directly. You probably have been investigated before by an echo, uh, with an echocardiogram. Uh, amyloid can definitely affect the heart and the valves. Connective tissue disease, including uh, lupus and antiphospholipid syndrome, as well as rheumatoid arthritis. And I would like to point out the advanced chronic kidney disease with calcium deposits on the aortic and mitral valve. Uh, and we see that these patients can uh, develop uh, mitral or aortic valve stenosis or regurgitation because of calcification of the valves. 
and these can progress extremely quickly. Uh, it's impressive uh, how quickly some with end stage renal failure can progress from mild aortic stenosis to severe aortic stenosis, or um, can progress in, in terms of microvascular stenosis with a lot of classification of mitral annuals and the pathways themselves. So keep an eye on patients with advanced chronic kidney disease if we have any findings suggestive of um, valve involvement, do not hesitate to move forward to request an echocardiogram and refer them accordingly. And the last thing is the drug induced valvular artery disease, which is not very common, but you may come across. And since we, we discussed this topic in the primary care, uh, just from academic industry to present uh, some medications that can cause valve problems. Uh, and these are agotamine, methysogate, pergolite, uh, carbergoline, bromocryptin, the MDMA, the ecstasy, and benfluorex. So, some of them are anorexis, and uh, there is a pathology called fen-fen uh from fenfluramine uh, and other anorexic food, which can cause thickening on the usually aortic and mitral valve uh, leaflets. In a pathology sometimes uh, similar to carcinoid heart disease involving serotonin, but just from academic industry to have that in mind. But the next thing you need to look at is the social history, uh, and especially uh, populations from endemic areas of rheumatic fever. Of course, the, the UK population is very diverse, and the native um, British people have very low prevalence of rheumatic fever, rheumatic heart disease. But there are many people in the community who come from Africa or Asia or South America where rheumatic fever is, uh, uh, is quite prominent, and this present with us usually at young age with much stenosis. So, I keep an eye to look at the social history and the background and the origin of people, where they come from, where they grew up, uh, where they spent their childhood. Uh, then the family history is also important because some forms of valve disease can be inherited. And uh, this particularly applies to the bicuspid aortic valve. We know that uh, first degree relatives of people with bicuspid aortic valve, they're more likely to have bicuspid aortic valve that is inherited. And also much of our prolapse uh, specifically degenerative mitral disease, fibrolactic deficiency, and valve disease. This can also be inherited. Uh, we always recommend uh, people with these conditions to um, ha have their relatives screened. Uh, so both Ronak and, uh, and myself suggest the first degree relatives of patients with bicuspid valve and uh, degenerative mitral disease to have their first degree relatives be screened. But you may come across people who may tell you I have a brother who had this form of uh, valve problem. Uh, in that case, this uh, uh, speech that they may have a similar valve problem as well. And once you've gone through the history, the next step, and I think the key thing for diagnosis here uh, is the physical examination. And what, when we're talking about physical examination in valve disease, we're talking mainly about murmurs. Uh, I will not uh, expand that much. I believe most of you know uh, how to hospitalize the heart, how to identify the murmurs. Some key points here is that the systolic murmurs are more easy to identify compared to diastolic, and the diastolic murmurs are usually the aortic regurgitation and the mitral stenosis. So this can be easily missed even by cardiology trainees. My recommendation is always to listen at end expiration. Uh, definitely breath holding, but when you ask uh, patients to hold their breath, what they normally do, they take a deep breath and they stop their end inspiration. But that accumulates some air between the chest wall and the heart and makes uh, listening of the heart normals more difficult. So what I ask them to do is to breathe in, breathe out, and hold the breath at end expiration. That's reducing the distance between the chest wall and the heart and just better understanding uh, of the heart murmurs. It's always useful to combine the past examination so you can understand um, systole and diastole better. The radiation of the murmurs is quite important to identify uh, the pathology. And the heart sounds are also important. In some with severe aortic stenosis, the second heart sound is diminished because the aortic valve is not opening well. So the closing force is significantly reduced. So imagine a valve or a door closing from a full open position and closing from a mid open position. Uh, so if you, if you cannot hear the second heart sound clearly in the systolic murmur, that probably suggests severe aortic stenosis. On the other hand, you have very loud second heart sound, 
you may suggest pulmonary hypertension, and this is the pulmonary component of the second half sound, which is actually loud. Uh, be aware of flow murmur in young adults, and this is a benign murmur. Uh, this is sometimes not difficult to uh, differentiate from pathological murmurs. And I'm pretty sure that everybody's familiar uh, with the examination and the um, areas where you put your stethoscope. Uh, here in the right, in the crossing space on the right, you can see the aortic area and you can hear the aortic stenosis or the flow marrow. The aortic stenosis usually radiates to the carotids and to the apex. So remember that it radiates to the apex because the descending aorta is going this way and the vibrations actually travel through the descending aorta. So you can hear the marrow radiating to the apex as well as the carotids, which doesn't happen with the flow marrow. Uh, here on the other side of the sternum, the second intercostal space is the pulmonic area. You can hear the pulmonic stenosis, which is very uncommon, uh, or a flow murmur as well. A bit further down the third space is the air point, as we call it, and uh, you can hear very typically the aortic regurgitation or pulmonary regurgitation. You can also, because here, here is the outflow tract, the LV outflow tract, you can hear the murmur of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Further down to the cuspid area, where you can hear the whole historic neurotracuspid presentation. And at the apex is the mitral area. You can hear whole systolic murmur in mitral presentation. If there's much of a prolapse, typically the murmur is mid to end systolic, so it's shorter compared to uh, other forms of mitral presentation. And that's pretty much uh, where you listen. Of course, uh, as I said, you listen to the carotids and also the axilla, the mitral presentation is radiating towards the axilla. Other factors of the physical examination, because not only the auscultation, is the regular pulse. Uh, you may find atrial fibrillation most likely in mitral pathology. You will identify white pulse pressure. That's something very useful. I find in, in my practice, someone with uh, white pulse pressure, you may see diastolic pre systolic pressure 160 and diastolic 50. Uh, that suggests for severe ER. Collapsing pulse, again, the same, severe ER, or the corrigan sign, you see the current pulsation because they increased blood volume uh, during systole. The manual flash is not something we, we see commonly, I have to be honest. It's something we see in muscle stenosis, this uh, uh, plum red discoloration of the high cheeks. And that's because of um, increasing CO2 concentration and uh, vasodilator effect. Uh, the chest filtration is extremely useful and you need to do it uh, to look for fluid overload and pulmonary edema congestion. Um, and this is uh, uh, and evidence of left heart valve disease. Peripheral edema is something you can see in any sort of pathology, left or right. And also look for hepatomegaly. This can be seen in right heart valve disease, especially in tracheostomy uh, recurgitation. Uh, if, based on the, the above, you think that the heart valve is likely, then this patient will be referred for transvascular cardiogram, and then there's a pathway that this patient can enter the PAL clinic, and Ronak is going to talk to you. Uh, about that. I'll be happy to answer any questions if you have. Thank you so much, Alexandros. Um, so yes, if anyone has any questions um, before we move on to the next section where Ronak will talk about managing valve disease in primary care. Okay, I think we can move on. Thank you, Ronak. So, thank you very much, Alexandros, for an excellent summary in terms of identifying valve disease in primary care. Um, I'm going to try and touch a little bit about uh, managing valve disease in primary care, but I thought it would also be useful uh, to provide a few key facts in terms of the changing epidemiology of valve disease within the United Kingdom and the world, so we can put things in context. So first of all, I mean, I think it's quite well recognised that as clinicians and also general practitioners, we're starting to see an increase in the number of patients who have significant valve disease. And part of this undoubtedly reflects the changing demographics of our population with people living longer with comorbidities. Now, this graph essentially plots out the prevalence of heart valve disease based upon age. And we can see that the older individuals get the increasing prevalence there is of disease, and once you get to above the age of 75, up to about 7.5% of patients will have significant mitral valve disease. And this is largely mitral valve regurgitation, but also a significant proportion of patients 
will have significant or severe aortic valve disease. So about 3.5% of patients above the age of 75 will have severe aortic stenosis. And a number of these patients, both with mitral and aortic valve disease, will remain undetected until they become manifest with overt clinical symptoms. Now, when we look at valve disease related to deaths over various different years and time frames, we can see that the total number of deaths related to valvular heart disease is indeed increasing. And this partly relates to increasing life expectancy. Now, the majority of these patients uh, who die are related to valve disease. It's related to aortic valve disease and significant aortic valve stenosis. But we are also seeing a gradual increase in infective endocarditis with changing lifestyles population. Mitral valve disease and right-sided heart valve disease does not account for a significant proportion of valve disease related deaths. Now, the major problem that we have in valvular heart disease is that really there are very few effective medical treatments. Now, this is a very famous graph, along with the next slide I'm going to show you, which demonstrates the survival rates over five years for patients who have severe symptomatic aortic stenosis who are treated medically. And it's a well-established fact that usually after about two and a half to three years, once you develop symptoms associated with severe aortic stenosis, there is almost a 50% mortality. This once again is a very famous graph, and we know that once patients have severe aortic stenosis and are asymptomatic, they enter what we call a latent period, where they're in a low-risk group. The annual risk of mortality with someone with severe asymptomatic aortic stenosis is in the order of about 1 to 1.5%. Now, this situation dramatically changes once an individual develops the symptoms and you can see this line tailing off once symptoms have developed. Now, once you develop cardiac failure, there is a 50% mortality within 12 months. Once you develop syncope, about 2.5 year mortality. And once you develop angina, about 50% of patients will die within a five year time frame. So the holy grail of aortic stenosis timing and management is identifying just before patients are going to develop symptoms because once symptoms have ensued, the prognosis dramatically changes, and up to 13% of patients are recognized to die on a waiting list whilst awaiting intervention, whether that be TAVI or surgical aortic valve replacement surgery. Now, the same situation also applies to other valve disease states. This was a very elegant study that was recently published in the BMJ, which looked at a spectrum of patients who had multiple comorbidities, including frailty, COPD, diabetes mellitus, peripheral vascular disease, and it demonstrates that those patients who have moderate or severe mitral valve regurgitation, this adds as a discriminator in terms of predicting uh, poor outcomes. Also of note is actually that no or mild mitral regurgitation all can impact upon significant outcomes. So this is sending a message along with a similar graph for tricuspid valve regurgitation, that valve disease is certainly not a benign entity, even in the absence of symptoms, and then it can impact upon other patients' comorbidities and give a worse patient outcome. Now, one of the major challenges we face, uh, particularly within the secondary and tertiary centres, is that we only see a small fraction of the patients who have valvular heart disease. The majority of patients with valve disease owing to its prevalence are usually based in the community and go undetected. With the evolution of valve clinics over the last decade, we're starting to see more patients within dedicated services, but only a fraction of patients end up having surgery or transcatheter treatments. Now, many of the patients go undetected at present, uh, but really we want to be detecting these patients early, before the onset of overt symptoms, and making sure that those symptoms that patient manifest with, that's not incorrectly attributed to another cause, such as COPD or asthma, or general aging and a reduction in their exercise capacity. If we can intervene on patients early before the onset of symptoms, then I anticipate that there would be less morbidity and mortality. So how can we work together with our partners in general practice as a network in terms of improving healthcare for patients with valvular heart disease? As I've mentioned, I think the holy grail is certainly the early identification of valve disease because valve disease is progressive. However, predicting the rate of progression can be exceptionally difficult and there is no sort of easy mantra to tell you as to which rates patients will progress. We want to be optimizing the timing of surgery rather than rushing patients to surgery once patients are in congested cardiac failure or have been admitted with overt symptoms. 
We personally feel that this is most effectively achieved in a dedicated valve clinic where we can monitor outcomes. We have a callback policy for patients at guideline directed intervals. But where we can get help from our colleagues in the community is helping with the implementation of lifestyle measures, optimizing risk factors such as hypercholesterolemia, hypertension, advising patients to maintain a healthy weight, and also early identification of those patients who may have moderate or more valvular heart disease. Now, a little bit on pharmacotherapy of valvular heart disease, because really I think the mainstay of the management of heart valve disease in the community is early identification and onward referral. But there is a minor role for pharmacotherapy. The first thing to add is that investigators around the world have certainly explored pharmacotherapy for aortic stenosis. Many trials have been conducted on the use of statin therapy in the 2000s, the C study, the Saltire study, and also the Astronomer trial. But none of these demonstrated a delay in the rate of progression once patients have established aortic stenosis. There is a lot of interest at the moment, uh, this may interest some of you, in the role of lipoprotein little a and whether gene therapy, modification therapy, uh, will be able to impact upon aortic stenosis progression. And I think we'll see some interesting data emerge from this as trials emerge that are going to be conducted at King's College Hospital with Alexandros and also myself. We know that vasodilator treatment is a little bit controversial in patients with chronic aortic regurgitation, but still remains an indication in the ACC and ESC guidelines, particularly where the systolic blood pressure is greater than 140 millimeters of mercury. And when we talk about vasodilator therapy, we're talking about ACE inhibitors, we're talking about uh, hydralazine, and also things like neprilysin inhibitors. Now for secondary mitral valve regurgitation, this is an area where pharmacotherapy can make a significant impact. We know that ACE inhibitors can reduce the severity of mitral valve regurgitation in up to 42% of patients. Beta blockers similarly can reduce the severity of mitral valve regurgitation. And overall, goal-directed medical therapy for patients with heart failure and mitral valve regurgitation appears to reduce the severity of mitral valve regurgitation in up to about 40% of patients. So when patients with secondary mitral valve regurgitation and secondary mitral valve regurgitation occurs to those patients who have mitral valve regurgitation, not to an organic problem of their mitral valve leaflets, such as rheumatic disease, but a disease of the left ventricle, such as ischemic cardiomyopathy or significant left atrial dilatation, goal-directed medical therapy can reduce MR severity in up to about 40% of patients. One little sort of top tip, which we've learned about from the literature, that actually the presence of left bundle branch block is a poor predictor of response to goal-directed medical therapy. So if you have left bundle branch block, patients are likely not to exhibit a significant improvement in MR severity with medication alone. CRT also appears to therapy in patients with heart failure and significant mitral valve regurgitation in reducing MR severity. Now, I don't think there's any harm in re repeating some of this, um, but I think when to suspect heart valve disease really comes down to the presence or presentation of patients who have any number of a constellation of symptoms. And they can often uh, present atypically with cardiovascular symptoms that may lead you to think that they have another cause or etiology to their symptoms rather than valvular heart disease. A fluttering chest sensation may indicate that a patient has a problem with their mitral valve, chest pain or angina, may be attributable to patients who have ischemic mitral valve regurgitation or aortic stenosis. Shortness of breath is a common underlying denominator for all valvular heart disease. Fatigue, weakness and tiredness is often missed as a symptom of heart valve disease. Rapid weight gain may indicate fluid gain, abdominal ascites with tricuspid valve regurgitation or pedal edema, congestive cardiac failure. Presyncope, syncope with aortic stenosis and cough uh, pedal edema and abdominal bloating are all signs of congestive cardiac failure, which may have a common etiology of valvular heart disease. Now, some clues uh, that may be useful in the primary care setting are the symptoms that we've mentioned. You should have an increasing awareness that as patients age, there's an increasing prevalence of significant heart valve disease, as we've demonstrated on my initial two epidemiological slides. Prior myocardial infarction about 30 to 40% of patients with prior myocardial infarction will have mitral valve regurgitation upon echocardiography. Heart failure, as the left ventricle dilates, uh, can result in secondary mitral valve regurgitation.
Now, bear in mind, uh, individuals from different ethnic communities where there's a high prevalence of rheumatic heart disease, such as India, Sub-Saharan Africa and South America, we should be aware that these patients may have rheumatic mitral or aortic valve disease. And also, as Alexandros has mentioned, bear in mind first degree relatives of individuals with a bicuspid aortic valve, there is a 10% chance that a first degree relative may also have a bicuspid aortic valve. Also, if you see an individual who has a dilated aorta, always look at the echo report um, as to whether or not the patient has a bicuspid valve, Marfan's disease or a collagen abnormality, which may also predispose them to valve disease. Now, auscultation undoubtedly has a role, but I think it's also dependent on the pre-auscultation likelihood of an individual having cardiovascular disease. So if you have a patient who has symptoms, increasing age, they've got prior cardiovascular history and heart failure, then auscultation is likely to have a higher diagnostic yield. Now, I thought this would be quite interesting to include just a few ECGs to show that actually ECGs can also help you as an adjunct to your clinical examination. So here we have a 72-year-old man who presents with chest pain. I think you can appreciate that there's evidence of left ventricular hypertrophy with significant enlarged QRS complexes, and we see evidence of a strain pattern with T-wave inversion in AVL, V4, V5, and V6, and actually extends in V2 and V3. Now, a quick clue and a top tip is that T-wave inversion in AVL, AVL is the lead that does not lie. So in other words, the T-wave should always be upright in AVL. If you see T-wave inversion in AVL, it often indicates that there's an underlying problem, non-specific, within the heart, whether that's ischemic or valvular heart disease related. So we can see an ECG with left ventricular hypertrophy and repolarization abnormalities, an ejection systolic murmur is heard, and the LVH is consistent with aortic stenosis. We now have a 65-year-old woman who has hypertension and breathlessness, uh, we can see once again a very similar ECG, uh, left ventricular hypertrophy with repolarization abnormalities, a low-pitched S4 is heard, which is atrial contraction. Uh, this is possible diastolic heart failure, okay? Now, for our third ECG, we have a 32-year-old male with scoliosis, so a spinal deformity. So you would wonder about whether or not there's a collagen or genetic abnormality, four-month history of breathlessness, once again, we see another similar ECG with left ventricular hypertrophy with repolarization abnormalities. On this occasion, you hear an early diastolic murmur, and this would raise you uh, to suspect whether or not this patient has possible chronic aortic regurgitation. 70-year-old male with breathlessness, we can see that the patient has a sinus tachycardia. We can see, too, that we've got peaked P waves which would be in keeping with right atrial enlargement. We hear very soft heart sounds. So this is possible COPD, pulmonary hypertension, or core pulmonale. Now, another ECG, we've got a 26-year-old female who's 32 weeks pregnant. The ECG is entirely normal. There's no ST segment changes, no strain pattern, no left ventricular hypertrophy, no signs of left atrial or right atrial enlargement. This is a normal ECG. You hear an early systolic murmur, but audible first and second heart sounds. This is going to represent a physiological flow murmur and is unlikely to represent significant heart valve disease. We have a 46-year-old female with breathlessness. Now here we see left ventricular hypertrophy, large complexes, but we also see a negative component in V1 to the P wave. Now, this would be in keeping with left atrial enlargement, okay, so M mitrale. You hear a pansystolic murmur, and you would consider chronic mitral valve regurgitation. Now, the reason why I say chronic mitral valve regurgitation is that for left atrial enlargement, it's going to take a while for the volume overload in the left atrium to exert a left atrial dilatatory effect. So we often see left atrial dilatation in chronic mitral valve regurgitation, and that's why we're seeing the M mitrale. Just as a, a quick reminder in terms of P wave morphology in left atrial and right atrial enlargement, for left atrial enlargement, I simply look at V1. If you see a biphasic P wave and you see that the P wave has a terminal negative portion greater than 40 milliseconds, so one small square, and it's more than one millimeter deep, 
that's going to indicate left atrial enlargement. For right atrial enlargement, I simply look at lead two. If it's greater than 80 milliseconds, if it's higher than two millimeters, that's indicative of right atrial enlargement, which you would find in patients with corporal menale, pulmonary hypertension, and also right atrial enlargement secondary to significant tricuspid valve disease. Now, this is somewhat depressing. So I've spoken a lot, and as is Alexandros, about the utility of cardiac auscultation. Now, a recent uh, paper, which was published in Heart, looked at cardiac auscultation and its predictive power against detecting significant heart valve disease in asymptomatic primary care patients. Now, the bottom line for this is, unfortunately, auscultation did not aid in the separation of patients with and without significant valvular heart disease. Significant valvular heart disease, when detected by expert GPs, only had a sensitivity of 44% and a specificity of 69%. And the negative predictive value, which is potentially a little bit more concerning, for mild disease was good at 86%, but also for significant valvular heart disease was 88%. So I think we need to be using a lot of clues, uh, with, along with our auscultation, such as using the ECG and pretest probability in refining our detection of valvular heart disease. But also I think the bottom line is, is that early referral for open access echocardiography if you have some red flag signs. And some of these red flag signs I've listed on this slide would be atrial fibrillation. So any cause of left atrial dilatation is a substrate for atrial fibrillation, particularly mitral valve disease. Prior cardiac presentation, heart failure, ischemic heart disease, family history of valvular heart disease, an audible murmur, increasing age, the symptoms that I've displayed, and also certain demographics. Now, Alexandros is going to talk a little bit more about echocardiography and the echo report. Just a couple of things which I thought would be useful, that mild disease generally does not require a significant follow-up and is usually never clinically important. A subaortic bulge is common in older people, and in the majority is not significant, and trivial pericardial fluid in the pericardial sac is usually common and not significant. So when and where to refer? So I think that all patients with moderate or severe disease, symptomatic and asymptomatic, should be referred to a specialist heart valve clinic, such as the one that Alexandros runs at King's College Hospital or the Guy's service at Guy's and St. Thomas's. For mild disease, these patients generally do not require to be referred um, you can consider for surveillance and echocardiograms, but this is usually managed in general practice every three years because they have a slow rate of progression. So with that, I'm going to stop and open the floor to some questions, and then we'll pass back to Alexandros, uh, who'll take us through the echo reports. Thank you so much, Ronak. Um, any questions? So is there any, any questions or should I hand over to Alessandros to talk about echo interpretation? Alessandros, over to you. Okay, thank you. I don't have any, any questions. So we, we will continue with the interpretation of uh, echocardiograms in uh, valvular heart disease. Uh, let's show my presentation. So the echocardiogram uh, we perform, uh, we look at all uh, heart valves, and uh, any of these valves can be stenosed or can be recurrent stunt. Uh, so this topic actually includes aortic stenosis and recurrentation, mitral stenosis and recurrentation, tricuspid recurrentation, and of course tricuspid stenosis, pulmonary recurrentation, and pulmonary stenosis, which are very rare and quite uncommon to be uh, isolated. The general things you need to consider when you look at an echo report of someone has valve disease uh, are summarized in this slide. So number one, uh, in, uh, in my view, is the, the level of ventricular size injection fraction. And that gives you an idea how the heart is coping with a valve problem. Uh, and that is mainly referred to the aortic and mitral valve pathology. What determines 
the management of this patient has to uh, mainly with uh, the response of the left lateral left, 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 left in terms of size, injection fraction, if it can respond, if uh, still compensate or not. For the right side, but also for the left side, valves, we look at the right ridiculous size and stolic function uh, because, especially for mitral pathology, you may see the coronary pressure going up and uh, the right side of the heart start failing. And in this context, we always report the coronary artery systolic pressure, which you can see as PASP or, or RVSP, that's the right ventricular systolic pressure. This number comes always in the echo report on someone with valve disease. And it's something that is also important in management. Uh, we, we're really concerned where this goes up. The left atrial size is important, and you're going to see that in the echo report, especially for mitral valve disease. This is the main pathology that affects the left uh, atrial size, as uh, Rona very nicely showed with the ECG examples. You're going to see, of course, the severity of valve pathology. Uh, and we grade the, the severity as mild, moderate, and severe in most of the cases, or at least on the left side, uh, are valves, the aortic and the mitral valve. Irrespective of pathology, stenosis or regurgitation. You will see the etiology. Uh, Brock briefly mentioned previously functional mitral regurgitation, uh, primary mitral regurgitation, uh, and also uh, the anatomy by castle or tricastiotic valve. And also, you look for other valves because sometimes we may encounter multiple valve problems on the same patient. Starting with the aortic stenosis, uh, we do several measurements and uh, we use several methods to create the stenosis and uh, also the hemodynamic impact um, of the aortic stenosis. But the key things you will see is the mean and peak pressure gradient, uh, the maximum aortic valve velocity, which correlates with the peak pressure gradient. So the peak pressure gradients um, actually is uh, derived from the aortic valve maximum velocity, so it's pretty much the same thing. The aortic valve area, the narrower it is, the more significant the disease. And the dimensionless index or the velocity ratio, which is the velocity of the aortic valve um, of the LVOT actually towards the, the aortic valve. But this is something maybe is quite take that quite complex for an echo report that comes to the primary care. And uh, just to give you a, a brief example of what these uh, parameters mean, the mean and the peak pressure gradient is the gradient between the left ventricle and the uh, aorta. So here on the left side, this is a normal heart. And you see the, the pressure, the systolic pressure is 120 in the left ventricle, it's 120 in the aorta. So there's no obstruction here, the flow uh, in, this, uh, in this vector you see. In aortic stenosis, you see that the valve here is narrow. The end systolic pressure is 200 in the LV and 210 in the aorta. So 200 minus 110 is the pressure drop or the pressure gradient, and that's the peak pressure gradient. You also measure the mean pressure gradient, which is if, if we say these are the, the vectors from the catheterization, then the difference between the left ventricle and the aorta here is as the mean gradient. And as I said before, the peak gradient can be derived from the maximum velocity we, we can uh, record with, uh, with the Doppler in echocardiography. So the peak pressure gradient and the maximum velocity across the aortic valve are pretty much uh, the same thing. In terms of measurements, this is going, what we're going to see. And uh, as you can see, depending on, on the numbers here, the peak velocity, the mean pressure gradient, or can also be called uh, mean pressure drop, the valve area and the velocity ratio, we grade the stenosis mild, moderate, severe. We don't expect you to remember all this, uh, just uh, uh, an example or indication how this is chasing. So, a very high velocity above four minutes per second means that stenosis is severe. The mean pressure gradient are above 40, again, suggests severe stenosis. And the aortic valve area is below one, again, it's severe. It's between 1.5 and 2, it's only mild. The key findings in the aortic stenosis uh, is the severity, which should come on the echo report based on our measurements. Uh, keep in mind that sometimes the severity we put in the report does not necessarily correlate with the measurements, so there may be some discrepancy here in certain situations, which sometimes we explain in the echo report, but sometimes the, um, the assessment is more complex. It's also uh, based on visual uh, estimation assessment. The left ventricular injection fraction is fundamental. 
if someone with severe aortic stenosis has low ejection fraction, uh, that uh, warrants poor prognosis and uh, needs early intervention. The anatomy is important, it's a bicastal tricastal valve, because as we discussed before, in the case of bicastal aortic valve, we need to screen the relatives, but also we know that these are progressing faster compared to tricastal valves, and also the pronate pressures. If that goes up, uh, then we'll be concerned that the hemodynamic effect of the stenosis is more significant. In the aortic recuperation, you may see this parameters recorded in the ECHO report that the recuperation volume, or the recuperation orifice area, uh, and this pretty much how much blood is going back to the left ventricle. Uh, so this is a competent valve. This diastole, so the blood is flowing from the LA to the LV. This is a recuperation valve. And uh, you see now blood is coming from the aorta back to the LV. So the recuperation volume is how much blood is coming in each beat in terms of milliliters. The recuperation orifice area is how big this orifice. So here's competent, this valve is competent, and here there's a gap. So we have some methods to assess how big the gap is. And the stomach flow reversal in the descending aorta when the Recuperation significance of blood is coming all the way from descending out of back to the LV in, uh, in diastole. Fresh half time, I wouldn't bother with that quite technical in terms of uh, parameters. Um, and what's important also here to see what we discussed before the, the, the difference between the systolic and diastolic pressure in severe aortic recuperation. The numbers you're going to get here for severe aortic recuperation is above 60 recuperation volume and above 0.3 orifice area. Again, the bigger the numbers, the more significant is the requisition. Again, we don't expect anybody to remember this, but just to give an indication how uh, the severity is changing uh, based on these numbers, how the numbers are increasing, the severity becomes more significant. The key findings again here is the severity and uh, the LV size and LV. This is really fundamental. Because in aortic recuperation, the LV is increasing and the patient may remain asymptomatic even with big LV and reduced ejection fraction. It takes a long time for people to decompensate. They may start the community for a long time with reduced ejection fraction and no symptoms. And this is quite important to identify them because they may not respond well to aortic valve replacement. Again, the anatomy is very important for the reasons we explained before. We expect by bicuspid recruits on valve to progress faster compared to tricuspid. The prone pressure are quite important. And also we're going to report and support for you to look at the size of the aortic root and standing aorta. Uh, and as uh, Ronak said previously, the pathologies of the aortic root and standing aorta can um, be combined with aortic valve pathology and more commonly aortic regurgitation. Now in mitral stenosis, we going to report the pressure gradient, that's the pressure difference between the left atrium and the left ventricle, and also the mitral valve area. Again, this is a normal mitral valve, which is often where the blood is flowing from the left atrium into the left ventricle. This is a narrow mitral valve. You see the pressure here is 25 in the left atrium as opposed to 10 here, and there is this swelling here on the flow. The orifice is small, and that's the mitral valve area here that we calculate, and the pressure gradient is the difference between the diastolic pressure, the mean pressure here in the left edge and the diastolic pressure here, so there's no gradient practically. So here's 25 in the left edge and 6 in the left ventricle. So the difference between the 25 and 6, which is 19, is the pressure gradient between the LA and the LV, which is the peak gradient. We also calculate the mean gradient, which is more useful, but again, this is more technical in terms of like parameters that we calculate. Uh, and again, in terms of numbers, a mean pressure drop, a mean pressure gradient above 10, so just severe mitral stenosis, which corresponds to mitral valve area less than one centimeter square. The severity also is a key finding here, uh, is different management between mild and severe mitral stenosis. The left atrial size is very important because the mitral pathology affects the left atrial size primarily, uh, and secondly, the left ventricle, especially for especially only for mitral regurgitation, the mitral stenosis is not going to affect the, the left uh, ventricular size. But uh, bear in mind that the mitral stenosis increases significantly the coronary pressures. So this patient will present with coronary hypertension, and sometimes this is irreversible even after an operation. 
So it's quite a significant parameter in patients much as the nose of coronary pressure. And the matter regurgitation, again, this is a normal heart and systole. You see the mitral valve is complete and the blood is going from the left ventricle to the aorta. Though in the mitral regurgitation case, the mitral valve is incomplete and there's some blood flow going back to the left atrium and systole. That's why the left atrium becomes bigger and the pressure is going up as well. And what we're going to give you in the echo report is the recruitment volume, how much blood is, um, is going back to the left atrium, and what is the orifice. There was this gap here and the mitral valve, which uh, is uh, causing the regurgitation. The vena contraction, the piezo radius, something you're going to see, the vena contraction is pretty much this diameter, and the piezo radius is uh, a parameter that actually quantifies the flow across the, uh, the recruitment uh, orifice. Uh, I wouldn't bother much about that because it's quite technical again. And in terms of numbers, as the recruitment volume and recruitment volume area are increasing in number, mm -hmm. as, the, as in aortic regurgitation, the severity is more significant. At least from the BSC guidelines, and you can see the reference values in, in our reports. The key things here is the severity and the LV size and function. So the mitral regurgitation of the LV is very important. When the LV starts becoming bigger, we know that uh, this space is going to compensate sooner rather than later if we need to intervene. The left atrial size, uh, of course, as we discussed, is going to become bigger, and the coronary pressure is also going to go up as the mitral regurgitation becomes more significant. Now, in terms of tricuspid regurgitation, <clears throat> this is much more simple in terms of quantification. It's more complex for us as well. So we don't look at many things. We look at the vena contractor, which actually is the, the diameter of the, of the orifice, and the tricuspid valve, which is called the regurgitation. And these are the numbers of 5.7 means it's severe, and the visual range, as we discussed before. Uh, but again, this is not something that we put all the time on the echo reports. You most commonly see how severe the tricuspid regurgitation is. The RV size here is very important size and systolic function. If the RV fails, then things are really bad and uh, uh, this warrants very poor prognosis. Sometimes we don't even touch the tricuspid valve if the RV is big and uh, is severely impaired. And of course, the coronary pressure, which sometimes may be underestimated, but again, it's a technical aspect related to echocardiography and hemodynamics, so I will not bother you with that. Now, in tricuspid stenosis is very rare as an isolated pathology. Uh, if some like that comes across an echo report that needs to be seen by a uh, cardiology team, the valve, uh, the valve um, clinic as Ron had mentioned before. And the same applies to pulmonary stenosis uh, and uh, pulmonary regurgitation, especially if it's more than moderate. So uh, these are quite uncommon pathologies that needs to be seen uh, in the valve clinic. Uh, and in summary, what is important in the echo report is the severity of the valve disease. Is it mild, is it moderate, or is it severe? that uh, dictates the, the follow-up, the follow-up interval, and also the need for intervention. The ventricular size and function, both right and left, and also the coronary pressure, these are the key things uh, you look at an echo report with regards to uh, heart valve disease. And uh, I'll be happy to answer any questions if there are. Thank you so much, Alexandros. Unless there's any questions specifically about this section, I will hand over to Ron Ack to finish off to talk a little bit about the um, international guidelines. Thank you. Okay, so uh, thank you very much, Alexandros, and also um, Sally. So what I'm going to do is, I mean, the international guidelines is almost sort of 40 pages long and covers every aspect of valvular heart disease. So I think what would probably be more useful is for me just to stick with some of the core principles as to what our perspective, Alexandros and myself, is on the management of valve disease. Now, I think fundamental to the recent guidelines and also the last iteration of the guidelines by the ESC and the ACC is really identifying what a heart valve centre is. And a heart valve centre is one that does have access not only to cardiac surgery, but also dedicated heart valve clinics. So when we talk about heart valve clinics that exist across the network, what do we actually mean? So we're actually meaning a group of healthcare professionals who have dedicated expertise in valvular heart disease, who work in a dedicated environment with dedicated infrastructure in order to provide specialized and centralized evaluation, care, and education to patients with valvular heart disease. And this really forms the bulk of the guidelines in terms of the, the route entry 
into any further treatments or medical interventions. Now, the Heart Valve Clinic at Guy's Hospital, and the setup is dissimilar with Alexandros's group, is that we take referrals in our valve service from general cardiologists, um, other cardiologists from electrophysiology, interventional cardiologists, uh, cardiologists from the network, including Medway, Darrance Valley Hospital, and further afield. We take referrals directly from our primary care um, partners, from cardiac surgeons who want a further opinion on the severity of disease or the optimal timing of surgery, echocardiography physiologists running open access echo lists or in the department, and also from further afield in the network. Now, the types of patients we see is any patient with a valve heart disease problem. This may be a patient with endocarditis, prosthetic heart valve, complex disease, heart valve disease in the, comp in the sort of context of other cardiovascular conditions. Now, the Heart Valve Clinic at Guy's Hospital is formed of three essential components. We have a consultant heart valve disease specialist. So in, in my instance, myself and also Dr. Hancock um, and Dr. Grapser. We have five highly specialized, uh, dedicated valve physiologists, and they are specialists uh, in terms of training and doing clinical skills, listening to patients and taking detailed valve histories on our patients. And we have one specialist valve nurse who deals with the follow-up of patients following valve surgery, whether that's mitral valve repair surgery or prosthetic valves. Now, the service is linked in with a number of allied partners, including the anticoagulation clinic and the thrombosis team, the dental clinic at Guy's, health psychologists, and other departments further afield, such as neurology. We have same day access to exercise stress testing, valve stress echo, blood tests we do on the same day, TOE time frame is four days, cardiac CT within two days, and direct referrals to EP and pacemaker interrogations on the same day of the appointment. One of the virtues of the heart valve clinic is that we are intertwined with all of the MDTs that occur alongside our service. So for a patient who has a need for intervention, both Alexandros and myself will be able to tap in to a relevant MDT, many of which we attend and coordinate, whether that's for transcatheter aortic valves, transcatheter mitral treatments, mitral valve MDTs with surgeons, infective endocarditis MDTs, and also echocardiography MDTs. Um, and so any patient who gets seen who needs a more complex opinion or MDT input will generally get an MDT outcome within 24 to 48 hours of a decision of that uh, meeting being required. Now, our main role in the clinic is to educate and inform patients, to schedule examinations, make appointments, deliver appropriate care, and to inform and provide information to our GP partners in the network and to work collaboratively with one another. One of the advantages of the Valve Clinic is that we also have access to state-of-the-art technologies uh, to better define valvular heart disease for our patients with King's College London and uh, international partners, and also access to multi-center cardiothoracic surgical research, which is occurring in the United Kingdom. So this just once again goes through the type of patients that we see and the different roles of all of the different members of the team. Now, irrespective of whether or not a physiologist or clinical scientist or a nurse is seeing a patient with valve disease, they all are trained to take clinical histories, they're all trained on clinical examination skills, and also have dedicated focus training on valvular heart disease, so patients are getting equivalent care, irrespective of the member of the team that they're seeing. And we all have a preclinic MDT every morning where we discuss patients and GP queries that have come through on our hotline to make sure that we can respond rapidly to any specific queries, irrespective as to what those may be, and prioritize patients into various services. Now, this I thought would be useful in terms of what are our frequency of follow-up based on our guidelines. Now, you will have noted from the prevalence of valve disease and the epidemiological slides that I presented that in general, moderate valve disease is not usually a cause of an individual symptoms. Now, there are exceptions to this, but generally we feel that uh, they can be followed up usually on a 12 monthly basis with echocardiograms and a clinical assessment. Any patient with severe valve disease has six monthly echocardiograms and a detailed clinical assessment, dilated aortas, usually 12 month, mitral prolapse with mild regurgitation. So there is mitral prolapse, so the valve leaflets are organically abnormal. We would recommend three to five years. Bicuspid aortic valve with a normally functioning valve and no aortic dilatation, purely requires follow up in the three to five year time frame. And usually prosthetic valves 
had uh, specific requirements, but repaired mitral valves who follow up every 12 months to ensure competency and patency of repair. Now for prosthetic valves, uh, there are a lot of individuals who do mechanical valve surveillance every 12 months with an echocardiogram. That is not routinely required. Once a patient has a mechanical valve and they've had a post-surgical check of their valve, routine echocardiograms are not required. Mechanical valves have high durability. They are unlikely to fail, provided that patients have the dedicated valve advice that we give them in the clinic regarding adequate anticoagulation, prophylaxis against endocarditis, and looking after their general well-being. So patients who have mechanical valves will have clinical follow-up, but that will be either telephone or face-to-face, -face, asking about the presence or absence of new symptoms. Now, bioprosthetic valves, with established bioprosthetic valve design, such as the perimount valve, failure rates, once again, are exceptionally low, and we do not routinely recommend annual surveillance echocardiograms every single year. What we would say is that patients with established bioprosthetic valves have annual echocardiograms after 10 years to look for valve degeneration and valve degradation, but otherwise they just need a clinical assessment to make sure that they've been keeping well and they haven't developed any new cardiac symptoms, which may indicate early valve failure. Mitral valve replacements with bioprosthetic valves uh, usually should be followed up after five years, and also newer designs of bioprosthetic aortic or mitral valves and also TAVI valves. Well, Mark, you've got two minutes. Okay, so in conclusion, I do think that patients receive better care when they're seen in specialist heart valve clinics, suspect heart valve disease in patients greater than 75 years, murmurs, disproportionate symptoms, other cardiac conditions, and request open access echocardiograms and refer patients with moderate to severe heart valve disease to our valve clinic services. Now, the ESC guidelines on valvular heart disease have just been released in August 2021. And fundamental to the new ESC guidelines is not only the description of a heart valve center, but also heart valve clinics and an involvement in the patient in terms of decision making. Now, the principles of valve intervention, I think Alexandros has already covered. Um, and these tables are not things that you need to be aware of. They're things that we need to be certainly aware of in the clinic in terms of prompts to referral for surgery. But the principles on whether it's mitral regurgitation, aortic stenosis, or aortic regurgitation is looking for sequential change in the LV cavity dimensions, LV systolic function, and also the presence or absence of symptoms. And each of the valve lesions has slightly distinct differences between them. For mitral regurgitation, and this is primary mitral regurgitation, the two numbers you need to keep in your mind is a left ventricular end systolic size greater than 40 millimeters, or when the ejection fraction starts to deteriorate. And these would be prompts for referral to surgery. Now for secondary mitral valve regurgitation, you've already heard about goal-directed medical therapy, because this is a disease of the left ventricle. So optimizing pharmacotherapy in the community um, is also the, the fundamental treatment for mitral valve regurgitation. And then we would consider treatment for secondary mitral valve regurgitation based upon whether or not they have a, a target for revascularization and they've been optimized appropriately with pharmacotherapy and device therapy. Aortic regurgitation, principles of volume overload of the left ventricle apply once again, but we're a little bit more lenient. Our, our taglines is a left ventricular end systolic size of greater than 50 millimeters or the ejection fraction less than 50% as a prompt for referral to surgery. Aortic stenosis is nice and easy. Symptomatic severe aortic stenosis needs referral for surgery or when the ejection fraction is less than 50% or if a patient has symptoms revealed by exercise stress testing, that would be a prompt for us to refer patients to surgery. So in conclusion, valve disease guidelines change very frequently and that's one reason why patients should be seen in a valve clinic with dedicated valve specialists because it's almost impossible to keep up with changing guidelines. Patients with moderate to severe disease should be seen in our heart valve clinics. And our purpose is to optimize the timing for surgery to reduce comorbidities and mortality. We do manage all aspects of valve care. It's not only patients who are being referred imminently for surgery, we do offer a surveillance program and ongoing advice and care for patients after they've had their valves treated and also the management of patients following endocarditis or residual disease. It's an opportunity also for 
for patients to be involved in their decision-making process and also to be involved in groundbreaking trials and to access new treatments and also diagnostics, whether that's ECHO, CT or MRI based, also multi-centre trials for early enrolment uh, before they've developed overt symptoms. So with that, I'll stop. I know I'm pushing on, on the time limit and we'll open the floor up to any questions for either Alexandros or myself on any aspect of valvular heart disease. So I did see one a chat comment come up. So any patient who has a concern or symptomatic severe valve disease we keep aside urgent uh, appointment slots. So we will see patients with symptomatic severe disease within a one to two week time frame if that referral comes through to us. Um, another one thing I should mention is that we do have built in safety nets into our ECHO department. So between King's and St Thomas's Hospital, uh, the departments conduct more than 40,000 uh, echocardiograms per annum. And our physiologists who are doing outpatient echocardiograms for GP practices or other departments are alerted that if they have a patient with moderate to severe valve disease, that should trigger off a pathway to the heart valve clinics. And we would pick up those patients automatically. Now, occasionally patients do slip through the net and that's purely because of, you know, making sure that the physiologists are aware that that service is available. We have, you know, a huge throughput of staff, new staff members joining. But generally, we will try and pick up patients with significant valve disease the moment they have their echocardiograms. And that is one source of extra uh, less work for you. Uh, we'll try and pick those patients up and put them and plug them into our surveillance programs automatically. If they do get missed and the patient has severe symptomatic disease, we will aim to see those patients in additional clinic slots. And we always have capacity in our clinics for urgent walk-ins, usually within a one week time frame. Thank you, Ronak. Really helpful to have that information. Um, I think as it is now 33 minutes past two, and I'm sure everyone has got um, very busy desks to go back to. Um, so a huge thank you to Alexandros and Ronak. Um, if anyone's got any further questions, do pop them in the chat and we can um, hang around for a couple of minutes just to answer those if you need, if you need quick um, answers to questions. Um, but we will be circulating the link to this recording um, and do please feel free to share it with your colleagues. Thank you all very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Ronak. Thanks, Adrian. Thank you, everybody. Thank, Thank you. you.